six of us, if we could just make sure that's all. Um, okay, so let me welcome people. My name is Stephanie Owitz from the Adolf and Rose Levis JCC in Boca Raton. And I am delighted to bring you this program in cooperation with all of our other JCCs who are going to introduce themselves as well. We've got a great working partnership and we're bringing you many programs um, this summer and in the future. So uh, thank you to my partners and um, you can continue to introduce yourselves. Good afternoon, I'm Marcy Levitt, Director of Literary and Performing Arts from the David Mary Alper JCC in Miami. And we are thrilled that you are joining us here today. And we also are thrilled to be in partnership with our fellow JCCs in South Florida. Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Sepsonwall, Director of Cultural Arts and Adult Programs at the Miami Beach JCC. I'm coming to you live from Key West on vacation. Would not miss this opportunity to be with you all here today. And really excited for today's program. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Avivi Derlikman, and I'm the Cultural Arts Director from Orlando, Greater Orlando in Maitland. We're very excited to be partners with all South Florida JCCs. That's a wonderful opportunity, and we wish you enjoy today, and thank you so much. Hi, this is David Sarowitz. Welcome from the Michael Ann Russell Jewish Community Center, and I'm privileged to be a part of this working group with outstanding professionals from our sister Jewish community centers throughout Florida. We hope you enjoy today's program. And finally, I'm Debbie Hockman from the David Posnack JCC and equally um, excited. In the past, we have as the JCCs work together, but this virtual platform has given us a completely new way to work together and to really pull our whole community together um, so there is no boundary anymore from Orlando all the way down to Kendall. And we are just thrilled to have so many people from really around Florida be a part of this and actually outside of Florida. So welcome to our snowbirds as well, who get to be a part of our programming today. Um, I also, the other exciting part besides working with these amazing professionals is I feel lucky that part of um, our programming is that we have decided that we are trying to do a Florida twist on our author series. And so we're using moderators who are locals or have some local connection. And one of our favorite moderators at the David Posnack JCC is today's Carol, moderator, Carol Shuham, who not only is an amazing volunteer for our book festival, but is an avid reader. And because she's an avid reader is an amazing moderator because she's a reader's reader moderator if that makes sense like she knows exactly what questions you as a reader want to know so um, we are thrilled that she is with us today as well as linda loigman who is was at our jcc and at many of these jccs we're happy that to welcome her back virtually but i'm going to do a formal introduction of carol and then let carol and linda take over from here but just to give you some background on carol for those that don't know Carol was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and obtained a degree in civil engineering from John Hopkins University. She went on to obtain her Juris Doctorate from University of Maryland, and she recently was elected to serve as commissioner in the city of Hollywood, where she and her husband um, live and have her law practice. So Carol, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, well, first, I want to say how honored I am to be here and to be able to have a conversation with Linda about her wonderful book. Um, and just to touch on what I think uh, Stephanie was saying, you know, this whole COVID thing has been kind of a nightmare, but there really have been some true silver linings. And the fact that our JCCs get to work together like this and we get to reach across our border cities and we've all gotten to know how to Zoom. I think that's definitely one of the, the silver linings. So um, before we, we get into it, I want to tell everybody a little bit about Linda. She um, is clearly a, a brilliant author, and she grew up in Massachusetts. Um, she first received her um, bachelor's from Harvard in English and American literature and went on to Columbia Law School. After practicing law for about eight years, and I think it was the States and Trust, she um, um, 
moved to New York and lives in Chappaqua where she has raised her two children and she lives with her husband and children there. Her first book was Two Family House, uh, which she wrote while she was still a student at the Writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence College. And um, that was chosen by Goodreads as the best book for March in 2016 and was a nominee for the Goodreads 2016 Choice Awards and uh, for historical fiction. And I I'm confident this book will uh, receive similar accolades. Uh, the Wartime Sisters is their, her second novel. Um, to me, it was a story about complex family dynamics uh, that occurred during World War II, but the war itself was a backdrop. And really the book is all about what was happening on the home front. But um, Linda, before we get into the book too much, uh, I think so many people on this call right now are gonna have one question for you being from Chappaqua, and that is how is Hillary? <laughs> Hi everyone. I haven't seen Hillary. Um, I, I, so I assume that she's taking the, the, um, all of the stay at home measures very seriously. Um, but I, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, to, I, I can't even name all of the people who have worked so hard to put this program together and all of the JCCs. Um, coming to Florida has always been such a highlight for me on, on book tour. I was so sad that I didn't get to, to come again. Um, this March, I was supposed to be there. And, you know, I'm so thrilled to be with all of you today. There are so many of you. It's really just such an honor to have everybody here. And thank you so much to Carol for reading and for moderating. And I'm just excited. I'm really excited to, that, that we can do this. My pleasure. Um, you know, uh, Debbie mentioned I'm from Baltimore and so much about this book. Um, and I'm, I'm older than you, so I was a, er, a child in the 60s and teenager in the 70s, but so much of the story was familiar from hearing my parents and their friends talk about how they grew up and where they grew up. And, um, but like I said, the war is kind of going on, uh, World War II is going on during the story, but it's not the focus of the story. It's kind of yeah. happening in the background. And the focus is what's happening between these two sisters, Ruth and Millie. And um, I'm just curious, there's no battle scenes in the, in the book, but there's definitely battles amongst this family. And I'm wondering how did you um, land on this backdrop of the story, this armory and well, first Brooklyn and then the armory in Springfield, Massachusetts. How, how did you get there? It was a little bit of a twisty path. So it didn't, it, it, I, I didn't intend to write a book um, set during World War II. It wasn't really, you know, where I started at all. I started um, with some of the stories that, that I heard from my mother and her sisters growing up. So my first book, The Two Family House, was set, the inspiration was, really came from my mother's childhood home in Brooklyn. But when my mom was 18 years old, her family moved from Brooklyn to Springfield. And that was a big move because it was moving from a big city where all of their relatives, all of their friends were, um, to this city of strangers, basically. And I always say that those stories, the, the stories that were told during the Brooklyn phase of their childhood were bright and cheerful and full of life. And the Springfield stories were sort of told in the language of loss because of everyone that they left behind. Um, and so when I went to write my second book, it was it seemed sort of natural to me to sort of write about this next phase of, of sort of my family's history um, in a way. And so I was going to write about sisters in transition, um, sisters who had moved from a big city to a small one. I wanted to, one of the things my mom used to talk about was how different it was being Jewish in a place that wasn't Brooklyn. And certainly um, when she moved to Springfield, it was early 1960s. And there were a lot, it was a large Jewish population, but it still was ne wasn't the same. So, you know, the, that was something I wanted to cover. I also really wanted to touch on the topic of sort of family roles and the way that when we're young, we're put into a role sometimes by our family. We're the smart one or we're the responsible one or whatever it is, you see that in the story and how we can't really escape those roles. And the armory came into play because I just, it was going to be like one page in the book. I had this idea for a character who was going to be an older woman. And my thought was, she was going to have a backstory of having worked at the armory during World War II because this book was going to take place in the 60s and that was going to be her backstory. So I thought, well, I need to do a little bit of research because I don't even know what job this woman might have had. We all know that women were such a big part of, you know, the defense 
industry during World War II because the men were away. The, we had, have the picture of Rosie the Riveter in our heads, but we don't know exactly what they did at the Springfield Armory, or I didn't. Um, and I started researching a little bit. And then of course, I, I just became captivated because one of the things that I found um, was a website that had recorded interviews of about 25 people and about half of those were women who had lived and or worked at the armory during World War II. And the interviews were done in the 80s. Um, it was like 25 hours worth of interviews and I listened to all of them. I started listening and I thought, well, I'll just like listen to a snippet. And I just sat there, you know, for days listening to these interviews. Uh -huh. So there was a woman who had been um, a single mother and put together triggers and it was her first job and she was 18 years old when she started working at the armory. There was a woman who was the commanding officer's wife at the time and she talked about the grounds and these beautiful gardens and the tennis courts and how she used to go to the greenhouses and get flowers and deliver them to the other officer's wives. And it just, I, when I heard that, I just couldn't imagine what this place was. I mean, I thought it was a factory. I thought it was one building right mm -hmm. that they all went to they made guns they left <laughs> like there was but the idea that it was a base that there were homes on it that it was this landscaped beautiful garden like park you know atmosphere just never occurred to me so that was why I, when i heard those stories and i heard the way they spoke about it was it was the grounds and it was the women and the way they spoke about their jobs and they were so proud of what they had done and what they had contributed to, you know, that they, it gave them such a sense of purpose. And when I heard all those stories, I wanted to write about those women also. So it became not just a story about sisters, um, but about that greater sisterhood of women who were working at the uh, Again, in Baltimore, we had an armory and I don't, in, in my recollection, it, it wasn't as um, campus-like as what you've described here, but it was a beautiful building. And I understand that you have some pictures I do. Um, I'm gonna, okay. yeah, yeah, I have, I'm gonna show you guys, I'm gonna share my screen. So just let me know, hopefully, it's gonna take me a second, but hopefully I'm gonna show you some of the pictures of the armory. Um, so you can see what I saw when I have to do a different view. I'm gonna do slideshow view. And I'm gonna show you some of the things that I was able to see. So this was kind of the first um, drawing that I saw of the armory. The, one of the things that was so interesting was it, it was so much older than I ever thought. George Washington actually commissioned the armory because after the war, they, he wanted to have a place where we made weapons. You know, we needed more armories. We needed to make more, more weapons instead of getting them from the French. Um, so this is, it just sort of gives you a scene of the layout. Today, actually, the armory campus is a college campus. It's Springfield Technical Community College. Um, these are just, I, I want to show you the grounds, but these are just some wonderful photos of the women. I think this is the greatest acronym ever, WOW, which stands for <laughs> Ordnance Worker, and it's, it's yeah, so true. terrific. It's just, some, you know, some of the women who worked at the armory and the pictures, there were all these high school girls who, who worked there. That's what this photo is. And they were messenger, they served as messengers. So they, this, these are some girls, I think, um, for, some of them are from classical high school, which is actually where my dad went to high school. Um, and they, they went from building to building because there were over a hundred buildings there. There were, you know, administrative buildings, manufacturing buildings, homes that officers lived in. These are just some of the great photographs of the women. This is a map. Um, so this was my second step in my research. When I heard about these grounds, I wanted to know exactly what the layout was for the book to be able to picture where my characters were going. So this is from 1939 and the story takes place, you know, in the early forties. So it's very close. And I, if I move my cursor here, you can see there was a swimming pool right here. So one of the interviews that I listened to a young man, a, well, he wasn't a young man when he was interviewed, but he was a boy at the armory. And, um, he talked about going swimming. And so when I went to the army for the first time and I met the curator of the armory museum, I said, was there a swimming pool here that officers got to use? And he said, yeah, there was. So this whole area, this is Armory Square and this is Federal Square. So if you read the book, you know that on this side, it was, you know, all the homes. This is a whole open space. All the dots are trees. The orange squares are tennis courts. These are officers' homes. This was Ruth and Millie's house right here. This was the commanding officer's mansion, kind of right over here. Um, other homes were here, greenhouses here, the ballistics tunnels were here. So you can sort of get a sense of it. And it was really, when I first went to walk the grounds and I saw these pictures, it was this juxtaposition 
Um, this is the commanding officer's house right here. So you can see what a beautiful home it was. It's nothing like what you would picture an armory to be and how much land there was and this fountain in front. But it was the juxtaposition of this beautiful sort of natural park-like setting. And then the manufacturing area where weapons of war are being made. And that, you know, that combination, beauty and war, all together, it just made me realize I really wanted to set my story here. Um, these are more photographs of the gardens and you can see this is um, the Rose Arbor where Lillian sits with her husband. That's gorgeous. Um, you know, it's just nothing like you would think an armory would be. Um, this is, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll talk about the, those things later, those slides later, but um, just, I just wanna show you a little bit now. This is the main gate. So the main entrance to the armory, it still looks like this when I went to visit it. Um, it was just like this, except without the guards, but it has this sort of collegiate feel. And in the beginning of the story, you know, I set when Millie first comes to the army, this is what she sees. Wow. So again, this is the commanding officer's house um, and winter time. This is what it looked like inside. And I was able to go into this house and walk the rooms. Of course, they didn't have furniture in them when I walked through them, but it was so great to be able to be in this house and go through every inch of it. And what that helped me with was really figuring out those party scenes in Lillian's home. And you know, when you put a bunch of characters together in one room, you can create a lot of drama. And so I, you know, I could walk through those rooms and picture what the party scenes would be like. Mm -hmm. um, this is Ruth. This is Ruth's home. And wow. this is a photograph actually that I took of it today. So this is what it looks like today. It was more elegant back then. Um, are they used? To, is it being used today as part of the? So call? they were renovating it. Um, the the commanding officer's house is used. You can rent it for events. Um, mm -hmm. This house, I'm not sure what they were renovating it for, but it's not used as a dwelling. But a lot of the the, the old homes are used by the Springfield Technical Community College. Mm -hmm. um, but this one, it it made me laugh because you know it's a two family house, which it's it. You know, being the title of my first book, it makes me, it made me laugh, but it's a side-by-side -side home, but I got to go into this one too. And it was so elegant. You, well, it had been, you could see the bones of it. You could see what it had been in its heyday. And, you know, for even half of it um, had four bedrooms upstairs, a lot of them with fireplaces, a big fireplace downstairs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it made me really think about what Millie would have felt when she got there at the armory and saw that her sister was living in this beautiful home and had never invited her and what she would have been feeling like. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite photograph of all of the ones um, that I've found at the army because it's just all these women at the tables working. And I feel like this gives you a sense of that greater sisterhood of women working at the armory. Right. And this is the cafeteria where Arietta would have been, we can talk about her later, but that character would have been. Um, and this is, you know, I talk about lunchtime concerts. The Works Progress Administration hired all of these gardeners um, to take care of the grounds at the armory. And they also hired a ton of musicians because they gave lunchtime concerts. There was so much that was done to improve morale at that time and to really accommodate the needs of all of these people working at the armory. And mm -hmm. the city of Springfield did so many great things to, to accommodate them too, um, just in terms of keeping things open at odd times because the sh the sh there were three shifts the army was running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'm gonna stop there for now, but I can go back if you want me to. Um, but you know, that gives you sort of a sense of, of the place and, and what it was like and what the sorts of things that I was finding when I was first researching and why I felt so strongly that I had to set this. Oh, it's beautiful, I mean, really beautiful. I, and you know, the history of, of Brooklyn and Springfield and there's so much happening there. Um, but the, the, the feeling when you read the book, like you said, for me, I just had this image of Rosie the Riveter pop into my head for, you know, so, so many times when I was reading the book. Is that something like when you started writing it, you were like, okay, that's, that's kind of the sense of this book, are females helping during the war? Or did it just develop as the story developed? It really developed as I went along, you know, um, I... <sighs> It, it was something about listening to the women speak about their jobs that really, that really helped me with that because, and in a way it, it, when I, you know, when we, when we first started all of our lockdown, when we've all started being at home in March and we would start to see pictures on social media of people sewing masks and, you know, just in the beginning, especially when there was such a PPE shortage and people needed masks and, and 
you could see how proud people were. I didn't know that many people had sewing machines. I don't know about you, but I, I had no idea that all of you had these sewing machines stuck in your home somewhere. Um, but you saw the pride on people's faces that they knew when, and they would drop off masks at the hospitals when they knew that they were doing something to help their country. Because, right, it's kind of a war, you know, it's a different kind of war now, but it's, it's a sure. similar thing. And so that's what they felt. That's what, that's what, that's what they were, that's what was in their voice when they were speaking about these jobs. As women, it was so fascinating because for many of them, it was the first job that they ever had. And for like probably a great percentage of them, it was the only job that they had. Right. Well, the book starts out in Brooklyn and your last book was in Brooklyn. Is there, you mentioned your grandmother was, was uh, from Brooklyn. Is that the only connection? Did you ever live there? I mean, it feels so, such a part yeah. of the story. So I never lived in Brooklyn. My mom grew up in Brooklyn. So. So the, my first book is all about, um, you know, two families, sisters-in-law, not sisters, sisters-in-law who live in a two-family house. And my mother grew up living in the top floor of a two-family house with her two sisters and her parents. And my grandmother's brother lived downstairs and he also had three girls. So there were all these girls in this house and the cousins grew up, you know, running up and down the stairs together all the time. And it's really... I did do research for the first book about Brooklyn, um, and I did do a little bit of Brooklyn research, much lighter than the Armory research. Um, but it really is so much of it just came from all those stories that I've always been told. And I was really lucky. My grandmother um, lived until she was 92 years old. So she, you know, for the better part of my life, uh, she was telling me stories. And my aunts are, my mom unfortunately passed away, but my aunts are still very much around and tell me stories. And so I get so much of the character and the flavor from them. I actually have my middle 20 something son lives in Williamsburg. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's gone back to now, you know, now it's the coolest, have changed. Place yeah, it's the coolest place to be. So this book, as well as the last book, both come, they focus on siblings. I mean, in your first book, yes, sister-in-laws, but they were brothers. Mm -hmm. um, and this book, sisters, did you have siblings growing up? And is that part of what's pushing you uh, to these sibling relationship stories? So I have a brother, um, I don't have a sister, and so many people are surprised when I say that I don't have a sister. Other people have pointed out it's a good thing I don't have a sister, because if I had a sister, she would think that I was writing about her and she would be ah. curious with me all the time. Um, but I think I was always, because I didn't have a sister, I was fascinated by my mother's relationship with her two sisters. Like really, utterly fascinated. I was a kid who like, you know, I would, um, you know, back when we had, old fashioned telephones that you could pick up and listen in on other people's conversations. When my mom, my mom spoke to her sisters a couple times a day, you know, they were always on the phone with each other and I would listen in and because there were three of them, probably often someone was mad at one, you know, two were mad at one for something. And I just thought their whole, the dynamics, you know, all of it was just so fascinating and they were so different. And I don't know, I think it's really because of watching them growing up that, that those relationships are so fascinating to me. So this book is um, the, the, the two protagonists, I guess, are Millie and Ruth. They're two sisters that are completely different personalities. Um, we, we actually have three boys. And I remember thinking uh, or hearing other parents say, you know, you just want them to get along as adults. What happens as kids doesn't matter. They're going to fight. They're going to fight. But as adults, they'll, they'll, as long as that's what you're focused on is their long-term relationships. And this book really played to that a little bit, although it carried into adulthood. You know, at the end of the day, you want some uh, resolution of all of these uh, disparities and these fights. But it seemed to me, um, and I don't want to give too much away for people that haven't read the book, but both sisters uh, committed uh, a deception, um, or really a deception by omission. But for me personally, I felt like Ruth's was so much worse and um, yeah. I, I don't know, do you get that from, from readers that they, they measure what each sister's done and, and kind of weigh them? Yeah, I mean, there's always like a Team Millie versus Team Ruth kind of thing going on. Um, one of the greatest things, one of, well, the thing that makes me really happy when readers tell me is when they say, you know, I started out being Team Ruth because Millie seemed, you know, like she was... Yeah more of a one sure. and then I switched to team Millie and then I went back you know it's I I think I really like to write from multiple points of view and so the story is structured that way um you hear 
there are four different points of view in the story. So for those who haven't read Millie's, Ruth's, and then two of the other mm -hmm. characters, um, Lillian and Arietta. And I, I, I love to write that way because I feel like you, you can get in someone else's head and you can have, you can develop empathy for each sister. You can understand what drove each one to do what she did, even though it wasn't nice, it wasn't great, it was nothing, you know, that should have been done, but you can understand it when you, when you go back and you see. And I kind of, I like to, to sort of tell a scene from one person's point of view and then go back and tell the scene from another person's point of view. Yeah, I love that about the book. Yeah, I do feel like you never really know, you know, what someone else is yeah. thinking and, and, and what drives them to do what they're doing. I just wanted to share one funny comment with you from sure. Michaela. Uh, she says, I do remember when you could pick up a phone and listen in. <laughs> I haven't thought about that in a long time. <laughs> it's really, I'm really bummed out about that now that you can't do that anymore. It was super fun. <laughs> I had another uh, focus about the book and it kind of it carried through a little bit, but primarily at the beginning with Ruth and Millie's parents or throughout the scenes that they are in was this idea of uh, parental favoritism. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to ask you if it's something that you experienced or not, because it's not a nice question, but is it, what, what, uh, drew you to that storyline? So, okay. Well, I definitely wanted to talk about a, a parent's influence on sibling relationships because of course this mother has such a, such a tremendous influence. But I did tell you when we spoke very briefly before this interview, when you said, is there anything that I can't ask you? And I said, I'm an open book. I probably tell everyone to more things than I should. So when I was growing up, I've told this before in other book things, but when I talked about the Chi Family House, but when I was growing up, my grandmother, who I, I was very close to, but I, as an adult and as a young adult, but not as close when I was young, my grandmother completely favored my brother um, because he was a boy. And that was sort of part of the impetus for writing the Chi Family House, this idea of, of favoring, you know, children, especially in, in, you know, times gone by based on gender. Um, and so my, she was a woman who had three daughters and her oldest daughter was my mother and my mother had her first grandchild and he was a boy. And she would say, you know, he's my favorite. <laughs> like, I love boys. I love, you know, and she would just say it without any shame at all. So, um, so that was always in my head, but with this book, it was different. It wasn't that, that I wanted to, that I wanted to cover. It was more just parental expectations, um, as opposed to favoritism. Yes, their mother favored Millie in a certain way, but to me, it wasn't so much about favoritism as it was about expectations. What she thought Millie's life was going to be, and she thought it was going to be so fantastic because Millie was a beautiful girl. And so she thought just based on that alone, she could marry whoever she wanted and have this really glamorous, exciting life. And her expectations for Ruth were so limited because she just thought Ruth was dull. And, you know, being smart wasn't necessarily something to be valued. And she chose a man to marry who was not so attractive and kind of dull and kind of overweight and spoke too much about sciencey things. And so it's that idea of um, how those expectations, if, they're, if they are revealed and if they're talked about too much, can really influence how children see themselves and how children see their siblings too. Absolutely. So I, that was something that I really wanted to touch on in the story. Yeah, it was interesting because then Ruth, um, you know, not, not everyone has, has read the book, obviously, but they're the two sisters, one is stunning and the mother, um, you know, really prides herself on the daughter's looks and expectations revolve around her beauty. And the other daughter is a bookworm and very smart and practical. So, um, but the interesting thing is the smart and practical daughter, Ruth, ultimately had twins and I love the, the scene in the book where she's, you know, reflecting on how her parents or her mother in particular, um, you know, clearly favored looks and how she ironically had twins and was going to treat them equally forever. Right. And then she realized as the girls got older, it doesn't matter if they're twins or not twins, you can't treat your children equally. So, you know, that balance of not favoring, but recognizing the child's individual attributes. I thought you really captured that. It's a difficult thing. I mean, that's something, you know, I couldn't, I came to writing later in my life and I didn't, I wasn't a writer when I was younger, I was a lawyer. And I don't think I could have written either one of my books without being a mother. I really couldn't. And so that, those themes in this book 
Um, really, I was able to, I think, to try to to try to get them right. I don't know if I got them right, but to, but to, to really address them because I do have two children and I have one boy and I have one girl and they're really, really different. And I think motherhood is a constant exercise in acceptance and a constant exercise in unconditional love and in, you know, trying to meet your child where they are because we all, you know, people will say that their children Sometimes you meet someone and, and it seems like all their children are, you know, kind of the same or down the same path, but, but it's not really true. You know, I'm sure if you, if you, if you delve deeper, you would find that every child has their own different struggles. Every child has their own different strengths. And as parents, it's really a tough thing sometimes to let go of our expectations and of what we want. And especially if you have one, you know, who goes down a certain path and the other one goes down a completely different path. You have to let them, you can't, you can't make one, you know, you have to let them be who they are. And so that was an important thing for me to kind of address, even though it was just a little bit of the story, but, but I, I wanted to put that in there. Yeah. I mean, I thought the motherhood component of the story was really important. You had, you had Ruth and Millie's mother who it, it, to me, I, you know, I don't want to stereotype too much, but when you think of immigrants or early arrivals to the U.S. Um, of any ethnicity, um, the emphasis on education was so great, um, and I think especially within the Jewish community. And here you had these two daughters, and I think that the mother, you know, she was so obsessed with the appearance, and that, that struck me as something that was probably not typical of, of Brooklynites at the time. You know, it was always education, education, education. Ruth just seemed to have fallen into that herself right. as a bookworm. So right. I, did you think about that at all? Like the idea well, of a mother? Yeah, I mean, yes. And I would agree with you, but not always, because I do think, um, you know, when my mom was growing up, she, her father didn't want her, want to pay for her to go to college. And so that was something that I actually touched on in the two sure, families. For women. Yeah, right so, yeah. so yes, education, education, but not necessarily for their daughters. Mm -hmm. um, always for their sons, not always for their daughters. And yeah. even the mothers would have felt that way. Um, and again, it really depended on the community and it depended on the person. Um, you know, it, it, it just depends and, and individuals are different, but it has been my experience seeing some of the people in my own family that education, my mother was obsessed with education. I mean, completely obsessed with it because she didn't go to college. And that was sort of one of the great disappointments of her life, perhaps the greatest disappointment of her life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just, so she just sort of overcompensated immediately and, you know, we were like going on college tours when, I mean, we were very young and she was talking about it all the time. And, you know, she was, I remember, you know, she was chasing the mailman around the block for our college acceptance letters. And, you know, she was just so proud, just beyond yeah. proud. It was, I mean, beyond proud. And so for some people, yes, but for other people, it wasn't the case that, that they were encouraged. A yeah. great point. I, I read I read a few essays that you wrote and a few articles where you declared your desperate desire to have a daughter to the point that you and your husband actually negotiated about it. Yeah. <laughs> where do you think, tell us about that and and tell us where do you think that that came from? So that um, well, it came partly from you know when I was growing up, my grandmother was talk about boys and how much she wanted a boy, how she always wanted a boy because she lived in this house of women and she wanted a boy for all kinds of reasons. Like some of some of the reasons were more. I don't want to say any reason is valid. If whatever she was feeling was valid, but like some of the reasons would be like, well, a boy will eat whatever I put in front of him, and I want to feed a boy who wants to eat a lot, and these girls just don't eat enough. You know, like funny things like that. Um, but so when I was pregnant for the first time, we didn't find out what we were having. And, you know, I would talk to her and we would, at that point we were very close and I would talk to her a lot and I would say, you know, I want to have a girl. And it started out kind of like as teasing her cause she always wanted boys. And so I was teasing her, but then I realized that I did. I, I think I just wanted a girl cause I, cause I'm a woman and I just thought I wanted a girl. Um, I, I felt very guilty about it. It's something that I've talked a lot about when I speak about the T family house, that guilt that I had, because of course then she would say to me, 
you, it all that matters is that your child is healthy. You know, nothing right. else matters. And what, what was the deal with your husband? The deal was that we would have, I wanted really more kids. I wanted three kids and he wanted two. And so the deal was that if we had two boys at first, we would try again for a third to see if we got a girl. But when my, our daughter was born and they said, it's a girl, he said, like, I won. <laughs> like, like, that was his immediate, like, that was his first thought. Like, he won the deal, the bet, whatever. And so, yeah, so we have one of each. So it's a very funny thing. We had a similar deal and the third was a boy. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, and yeah, so yeah, I mean, it ha that happens a lot. And sometimes people have twin boys for their third and then it's their third and their fourth. <laughs> exactly. So speaking of daughters, you know, the book, I guess, was written in primarily what year? 2018, 19? Um, um, I, oh, when did it come out? It came out in the Okay, came out in 2019 originally. So I was writing it in 2017, 2018. Yeah. So it just struck me, there's a scene in the book um, where Millie is walking home alone from a party and she is assaulted. Mm -hmm. um, and I was curious, I, you know, it feels like a very natural part of the book, but it struck me that it was, you know, an, an isolated incident. Mm -hmm. And it was probably during a lot of the Me Too uh, articles. And I was curious, First of all, how that ended up in the book, and and, right. and you know, and secondly, your thoughts of um, then versus now in a situation like that. Right. So it wasn't me. It wasn't really the height of me too when I was writing that at all. It sort of came into the story. It 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 changed a little bit from where it first started. Um, I in some earlier versions of the story and earlier drafts. Ruth was a little bit more, um, just more difficult, more unfeeling, even less compassionate. And I think that I originally, I, I was thinking that in that same way that, you know, the very early scene in the book when she feels that Millie has stolen the attention um, from this boy and who comes to her house for dinner, Walter. And she feels that you know, every time she brings a, a man into the house, Millie, just by her very presence, just, you know, the men drop her and run to her sister because she's that beautiful. Um, that the resentment from those early incidents would have built up in her a lot more. And so I was toying with this idea of her just sort of thinking that Millie was doing that at the army, you know, at, at the armory and that maybe some husbands were expressing interest in Millie. And Millie was, in this version, always swatting them away and, and saying no, 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 but Ruth was going to blame her for it. Right. And, and so it started kind of that way. And that became something that I didn't really like. It wasn't really working. And it, it changed into this encounter um, with this man. And that it sort of changed when I decided I was going to have this subplot of a, a sabotage subplot um, where people were going to accuse Millie and Arietta of maybe starting this fire because that was that was one of the issues of the day too. Um, that that people were always afraid of spies during World War II and especially spies sort of sabotaging these defense plants and, and getting in the way of, of production. Um, you know, with explosions or fires or whatever it might be. So it's sort of, I was, you know, I was kind of thinking and, and I needed an impetus for someone to be angry and it just sort of morphed into that. So that yeah. was sort of how it came to be. But there was a lot of sexism at the armory. Um, you know, there, the, one of the things that I used in my research were these um, booklets that people at the armory used to publish every month. They were called the Armory News and I, I have photographs of them. And um, actually, can I go to a screen share and show you something real quick? All right, I'm gonna do that real quick. Um, I'm gonna go back to this PowerPoint and share this. So, okay, so this is, a, this is the Armory News. Um, it just happened to be on that one. So th these were these pamphlets. They looked like a playbill. They were about 30 pages. And inside were all kinds of story. There would be a couple of serious war articles, but there would be cartoons. There would be things about, you know, what you should wear at the Armory. There would be all the sports scores because there were all these sports teams at the Armory that people were involved in. Um, and there, were, there was something that I found that really like sort of drove home the sexism of the time. 
Um, this is just an example of, you know, what you should wear when you work at the armory. These were the sorts of things that were in the pages. Um, this was, you know, something about spies, which sort of inspired the, 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 that, that subplot. This is the Armory Rifle Club that Millie was a part of. But here we go. So you can see this article talks about when the Armory received this Army Award and everyone got a pin. So if you read this thing on here, page 22, this captain was presenting pins. The first lovely girl, he said this should be worth a kiss. She gave him a kiss. By the end, he, you know, he was covered in, in lipstick marks and they say, this is the last line. This is what really got me. Nice going, Captain. You know, these are the sorts of things that were published in this Armory newsletter. And also on this page, you can see there was a Miss Springfield Armory contest. So these were some of the things that were going on at the time. And um, they made me really think about putting some of that in the story. I couldn't really ignore them. Of course, when you see that, you know that that was I don't want to say appropriate for the time because it was never appropriate, but it was, uh, it was not unexpected. It was not surprising that those things were happening and being said and being printed in this newsletter. But um, I wanted to kind of put something in to address it. Right. That's, those, those are amazing pictures. Was, when, you, when you were listening to the recordings from the Armory, did they help you develop these characters and these ideas? Yeah, definitely. So. Um, Listening to this commanding officer's wife absolutely helped me figure out Lillian. And then I don't know if you remember, um, so when I, I'm going to just share again. So when, um, when I was researching for the story and I was thinking about Lillian, I, I learned about Carol Lombard. Here's just a picture of Carol Lombard. Yeah. I didn't know her story. I don't know if, if, I'm sure some of the people that are listening do. But so she was, you know, a famous movie actress. Um, Clark Gable was her second husband. But she, she decided that she was going to go on a war bond drive very shortly after the US got into the war, into the war very shortly after um, Pearl Harbor. So in January of 1942, she took a trip on an airplane to her home state. She raised $2 million in one night which is like $34 million today, an oh unheard of sum in one evening, and her plane crashed on the way home back to Hollywood. And she was 32 years old. And she just, to me, she was like a casualty of war, certainly not a soldier, um, but someone who had lost her life in service to her country without question. And so Lillian, you know, I, I was sort of drawing on her as an inspiration physically for Lillian, because that's who I picture when I think of Lillian, but also just that kind of character. And so yeah. Lillian became someone that, you know, became the third sort of person in my story. And then um, the character of Arietta became the, the fourth one. And so the reason that Arietta came into my head, and this is a photograph of Sophie Tucker, who was a very famous vaudeville actress, act, singer at that time. Um, a very body kind of performer. And on this side here, this is a picture of someone named Willette Whitaker, who I have never heard of before, but this was actually an excerpt from the Armory News. So the Armory News used to do these spotlight pieces on different people who worked at the Armory who had other lives before they worked at the Armory and they were singers or they were all kinds of things. So there was a, there was a, a line in a book that I read while I was doing research. I'm gonna see if I can find it. Um, that just put the idea of Arietta in my head. Here it is. So in one of the books that I was reading, it said women of every strata of society did their bit. A woman college professor worked as a lathe operator. A gold star mother was employed as a woodworker and a well-known opera singer worked as a short order cook in the armory cafeteria. So when I read that, this idea of a singing cook is just like, what's a better character than a singing cook? I don't know. It just seemed like a, a, great really nice, yeah, a great departure and a character who could be a little bit lighter, you know, than, than, your, than the other characters who were more, you know, sensitive, more tormented, you know, just so she, she became my fourth main character in the story. So it leads me to a question I had, which was, you know, the story is definitely focused on a Jewish family, but there are a few, uh, and, and, and the, those characters are looked at under a pretty harsh light. You know, we, we see their flaws, but there are several non-Jewish characters in the story. Uh, you know, well, first in the Jewish category, Lenny, you know, right. Lenny is a loser, author is boring, you know, but then when you get to the, the non-Jews in the story, the big characters like... Uh, Lillian and Arietta, 
and uh, her husband Patrick, they're they're very gently treated. I thought, you know, they're they're these wonderful characters. So it just <laughs> kind of struck me. <laughs> <laughs> they're gently treated. That's such an interesting phrase. Yeah, gently treated. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, Lillian had like a really horrible life. So I don't think that, I mean, her upbringing was, she personally was not treated yeah. in her life. I guess maybe I'm a little bit nicer to her. Um, yeah, I guess that's because the conflict, the main conflict is between, the main war is between Millie and Ruth. So mm -hmm. I am definitely showing their, their all their flaws without question. A question I had was, you know, during that time period, Ruth, when she gets to the armory, um, there, you know, you get a, a hint, there's a hint of anti-Semitism, you know, not even anti-Semitism, just that people aren't accustomed to right. working side by side with Jewish people. Right. Um, but you really get a much greater sense of this anti-Italian or like you were saying, mm -hmm. um, suspect spies. And, you know, I, I really, I think maybe sometimes as a Jewish community, we, we, assume that we're always, you know, we're, we're the victims, but I hadn't really thought much about how Italian Americans were treated during I that read time. a really interesting book about that when I was, when I was sort of figuring out that sabotage plot and that, and that whole idea that, that they would be accused. And there was a lot of anti-Italian sentiment during the war. It wasn't as much in the Northeast because there were so many Italians here, but in California, especially, it was terrible. And some of them were put like in, in you know, they were put in internment camps. The people in San Francisco, you couldn't have, their fishing boats were taken away. Actually, um, you had to like carry, if you were, if you were an Italian immigrant and you hadn't become a US citizen, you had to carry your papers with you all the time. You, oh. they weren't allowed to have radios. Um, they weren't allowed to live near defense plants. Joe DiMaggio's father actually got his fishing boat taken away. And the only reason he wasn't, that things weren't even worse for him was because he was Joe DiMaggio's father, but he was out in California. And so there, there are, it would be, I don't know if that's my story to tell, but it would be a fantastic story to, to write about some of that and some of what went on. But wow. I was very surprised and I really, I it was really an education for me to learn about that. I, I found that to be a really interesting component of the story. And it, it makes me curious, um, just, you know, looking ahead to today and the world that we're living in today with like this ongoing social unrest and demands for social justice. I'm wondering if any of your extensive research that you've done about the 40s and, and this type of anti anything at that time gives you any, any insights um, today to maybe writing past wrongs or just addressing in, in, in uh, addressing the situation we find ourselves in today? That's such an interesting question. It's, I mean, I think the most important thing um, in many ways now, not, not even just in, with, with the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's going on, but just in sort of our whole political landscape, and I don't want to get political, but is tolerance. You know, we, we have become such an intolerant society and no one is tolerating anyone else. And there's such, there, there's this whole idea of cancel culture, you know, that, that, that this person is being canceled or that person is being canceled and people's lives are being, you know, sort of turned upside down um, for speaking out on about anything. Um, so tolerance is, is important. It was not, I, one of the things that I, that I really liked when I read the, about the armory, and it's interesting because you mentioned that there were characters of different religions, you know, of these four women, the two Jewish sisters, but then Arietta is Catholic and Lillian is Protestant. And there was something that I read when I was doing research about how in the early days of the army, more b before World War II, even before World War I, that it was really a place of religious tolerance, that there were a lot of different religions there and that a lot of different people of different religions worked there together. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really interesting, very lovely kind of idea. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to have the other characters each representing a different religion and sort of one of the reasons why I had Arietta um, have an Italian background because I wanted her to be an Italian Catholic. Um, and it just sort of, that, that just sort of worked out. I don't, I wish I had a better answer for your question. I, I don't, I, I, I don't have answers. I'm heartbroken um, for where we are and mm -hmm. writing helps me get through it. Everyone needs something to help them get through it. Yeah. But 
So we have a question from, uh, from Cindy, and she uh, ties to what you were just saying. Can you remember the moment where you decided to be an author, and how do you find the psychological awareness to create the stories? So thank you for your question. Um, so I never really thought, I, I didn't have a moment where I said I'm going to be an author. I just, I just had a story that I wanted to tell. And so the story of the two family house was that story. And it came to me when my daughter was like six months old and my daughter um, is turned 21 in January. So that was a long time ago. And it took me like, you know, over 15 years to sort of just get the courage to write it down and try to figure out how to write a book. Um, and it took a lot of time and I took a lot of classes and, and I did that. But I think I have always been a storyteller. I've always been interested in stories. I'm the kind of person who, you know, if you see a movie and you say, I saw this great movie, I say, tell me the story. What is the story? And they say, don't you, I'll spoil it for you. But you can never spoil a story for me because I just, I, I could, you could tell me the whole thing, every detail, and I would still go see it and enjoy it just as much because it's all in the telling. So I, you know, I just, I've always had that part of my personality. So we have a question from Peppy. She wants to know like, what, what can we look forward to next from you? But I, I wanted to add to that and say, when I was reading interviews with you after you wrote To Family House, you had indicated that you were working on a book about a young woman and her grandmother, um, mm -hmm. and that the grandmother had kept a secret from her family for 50 years. What happened to that story? Is that oh, next? Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. Question, what's I next? I, yeah, I think I have to learn a lesson, which is that I shouldn't talk about what I'm working on next because until it's done. So that grandmother's story kind of um, has morphed into a different story, which I, that's, in the meantime, I, I have written a third book. I'm not sure what's going to be happening with it yet. Um, because times are so uncertain in publishing and it is a very, it's, it's different from my other two books. Um, it's not the same kind of family story. And so I'm not sure what's going to happen with that one. So I'm holding off on that now for a little bit. And I'm working on another, it, it is a story about a grandmother, but it's changed to a grandson. It's not a granddaughter anymore. <laughs> so that book is, is in the works. And I hope I'll have news about that at some point um, soon, but it's a little bit of a strange time in the publishing world right now. Um, just because, you know, things are so uncertain and, and people are not getting to bookstores the same way. I know, it's crazy. Yeah. And I, I mean, this is the kind of book, as you read it, that you are seeing it before your eyes. And I think part of it, is, and, and smelling it too. I didn't, I had a question about, about senses. I mean, you write, there's one scene in there about stuffed cabbage, which just uh -huh. brought me right <laughs> to my grandmother's house. But, um, you know, the book is very much a visual uh, and to me. So have you been approached uh, by anyone regarding this book or your last book about a film? Because they seem like they would transition so easily to movies. I haven't, no. I would love to. I mean, that's every writer's dream, right? To get a, a film option. And, and from what I understand, getting a film option is only like the very tiniest first step because then someone has to actually want to make it. But I haven't, you know, I hope one day too. I always think the two family house would make a great like TV miniseries, you know? So yeah. that, would be, that would be really wonderful because it is... It does span so many years. And, and I like yeah. the Mrs. Maisel outfits. Yeah, 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 no, I mean, I would love it. It would be, there would be nothing that would be more fun. Um, I also like have this dream of writing a musical one day, even though I have like no musical ability at all, but I like to, I like to write, I like to rhyme. So I feel like I just want to write a musical of, of the two family house or the wartime sisters, but that's definitely never happening, but it would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> one, one more from JC. She said she loves that Linda put the books that she's reading or interested in at the end of the book. Um, what are you reading now? So I think in the, at, the, at the end of that book, I, was, um, I put a bunch of different fantasy and fairy tale things. Um, right now, this minute, I'm reading Courtney Sullivan's new book, which is called Friends and Strangers. And I love her stories. Um, so that's a new one. My favorite of her stories I don't know, this one might be my favorite, but I can't tell you yet because I'm just reading it now. But I, she, she wrote a book called Saints for All Occasions, which is about sisters. Um, and it's about sisters who have come from Ireland and, and all about the secrets that they have. And it's just, that's a really fantastic story. If anyone wants another sister story, that's a great one. Um, I just finished reading a book by Amy Popel. If someone wants something really funny, um, Amy Popel is a fantastic, funny writer, and she wrote a book called um, Small Admissions, which is about like the admissions 
for a New York City private school, but like for little kids. So it's really funny. Like <laughs> they're interviewing families and young children and stuff. And then she wrote a book called Limelight. Now her third book is going to be coming out in a couple of weeks and it's called Musical Chairs. And it's so relevant to right now because it was written pre-pandemic, but in the book, it's an adult woman and she goes to like her sort of falling down house and all her adult children come and live with her for the summer and they're all driving her crazy, which oh, I think a lot of people- Very timely, oh, yes. very timely. Yes. Well, we, we are running out of time, but I just okay. want to give you the opportunity if there's anything that I didn't, we didn't get a chance to talk about and uh, any component of the book that you wanted to mention oh, before we turn no, it over. No, no, I mean, I think we really covered everything, but I just would really like to say again, thank you to everyone. For thank you here. so much. And thank you to you because you did such, you know, I, I rarely get to have such a fun conversation. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for putting on, I know how hard it is, how much work it takes to, to prepare. So thank you. I really, really appreciate that. And also just to everyone who's listening, um, thank you for coming. And I hope that, you know, this just gives you a little bit of, of that feeling of connection that we're all missing right now. And I hope so very much to meet you all in person for my next book and get to Florida and, hug everybody and not hide, you know, behind my, all my accoutrements and just get to see you all. Um, Absolutely. We cannot wait to see you in person. Yeah. Be well, everyone. Yes. And I just want to chime back in to say, to thank you both, um, Carol and Linda. That was really, really, I could have sat here and listened to you both go on and on for, for a long time. It was really a, an engaging, wonderful discussion. So thank you both for being here with us. And please join us again, August 13th, we will be having Adina Sussman live from Israel, who will be delighting us with recipes from her acclaimed cookbook, Sababa, in conversation with the founder of the South Beach Food and Wine Festival, Lee Schrager. So we hope you will join us again then. And um, until then, um, stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much for being with us today. Bye everyone. Yeah. Take care. Bye.